Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to yet another edition of the Vibe and Higher podcast. As always, I am your host, Trevor, and today is a very special edition, actually. It's our 20th episode, which is very cool. And even cooler, we talked to our friend Liam Sheff, author, researcher. He's been on the podcast before. The dude is a firecracker, incredibly brilliant. Um, he wrote the book Official Stories, which we didn't touch on very much in this interview. But, I mean, we got into all kinds of stuff, and Liam really broke it down. We talked about religion, uh, you know, myth versus reality, myth versus fact. We got into the oil industry and how it affects our daily lives in a lot of ways that people take for granted or don't even realize. We talked about the issues in California with the Fukushima nuclear leak, uh, the big disgusting methane gas cloud down in L.A. We got into a lot of stuff. Liam, again, was on fire during this interview. I know you guys will like it. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Liam Sheff. All right, Liam. Well, thank you for uh, hopping on here with me today. I, I've been trying to, you know, I was uh, kind of hoping to do this a while ago, but here we are about a year later, and I'm glad that we're finally getting to it. Uh, you know, that was my fault. But uh, I've been extremely interested in the in the research that you've been doing, the stuff you've been posting on social media. Uh, I've talked to Joni about some of the stuff that you guys talk about. All incredibly interesting stuff. You've got a book you're working on. So uh, I'm uh, I'm really excited to kind of dive into it all with you. Thanks for uh, getting on here with me today. Yeah. Well, nobody knew uh, nobody knew that you you were supposed to or anything. So you you can edit that out and just act as if. <laughs> This is the way it was supposed yeah. to be. This was meant to be this way. That's it, what the New Agers right? say. Well, it was meant to, but probably was meant to be this way. <laughs> yeah, you've, I've, I imagine that you've, uh, you've angered quite a few New Agers on your Facebook profile lately. Good. good. <laughs> well, good. let's let's hop into that a little bit. Um, you actually you posted something the other day about um, sort of like the liberal New Age idea that. Uh, we're creating our own reality with our thoughts. Um, and that is definitely something that a lot of people, probably a lot of people listening to this are very into, um, as uh, definitely within that, uh, new age genre, I guess you might say, but w- what are your issues with that idea? Yeah, I used to live in, um, South Florida and I'll go, I'll, I'll go back to Florida again. And there was this, there was a lady, um, and she would always say, and she would say it to Robert and I, Robert Scott Bell. She'd yeah. say, you create your own reality. And she was it's like, well, what do you mean? <laughs> well, you create your own reality with your thoughts. She had a, a particular way of saying it and I, that I've never forgotten. And I would think, all right, this is person successful. She um, works in medicine. Um, she's bright. She, she didn't create... You mean your, what is your own reality? I was trying to define the boundaries of what do you mean by your own reality? Mm -hmm. I mean, like you get up and there's a road and you didn't put the road there. So that's part of your reality, but you didn't create it. Now the petroleum company created that. That's tar and, uh, and different little bits of broken rock. So you had to get into mining. Actually the mining operation that runs on mostly slave, you know, horrible jobs and labor and all kinds of Places that's well, actually, you have to destroy a lot of the planet to do the mining that you have to do. So, also, the tar comes out of that oil dredging and digging, and that's really chemistry, uh, petroleum, petrochemical industry. Okay, so the petrochemical industry created the road that you're stepping on. So, the first part of your reality was created by the petrochemical <laughs> industry. Now, the second part is you get in your car, oh, sorry, more petrochemical industry, and you drive to a place, whoops, gasoline, more petrochemical industry, and you go to a place that's built and constructed by, you know, giant cranes. Oh, whoops, more petrochemical industrial industry. It seems to me that our reality has been created by the industrial petrochemical industry. So I try to point that out to people. Mm. And of course they say, no, I mean your thoughts, like the stuff you think about. I think you create the stuff you think about, the stuff you think about. Uh, Isn't it more likely that you have a disposition that was given to you by whatever you want to call it? the astrological wheel of destiny, the gods and goddesses, what, you know, the ever loving universe, uh, and that you're simply living out your, the disposition, which you inherited to the best of your ability. No, and you create your own reality. Wait a second. What part is the reality is you are you creating? 
You mean the law of attraction? If you think you're going to be a millionaire, you're going to be a millionaire? Hold on. I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to be a millionaire. Ah, sorry, it didn't work. You, didn't, you weren't serious. You didn't think about it enough. Well, what would it be? To be a millionaire, I'd have a lot of paper money that was worth what? That was worth oil shares? A lot, or something a lot like of petrodollars. A lot of petrodollars. Okay, so the problem with you create your own reality is wrong. The petroleum industry creates the reality for all of us, and we inhabit it. We inhabit the diseased plastic landscape, uh, like characters in a Mario Kart game, driving around, trying to go places that we don't need to drive, but we're afraid to walk because it would just take too long. So we're just in, we, the, the petroleum industry created reality. And until you know that, you don't know where you're living and you don't know what could go wrong. The, the New Age liberals who think that, and the conservatives who don't think about it at all, the conservatives think that America is a is a given that's um, given to us by sending kids over to shoot other people, and that's why we're free. Uh, no, we just had more oil than everybody else for a long period of time, mm -hmm. most of the 20th century, and then Saudi Arabia. Then we were best friends, um, hand in glove, really, with with Saudi Arabia. And still, and, right to some degree, I would say. Oh God, yes, but it's falling apart. Mm -hmm. So the oil company creates our reality, and when oil runs low, our reality is going to be radically altered and shifted. That's the first thing that you, uh, the uh, the onlooker to the American, you know, death sport uh, civilization <laughs> can understand. We're we're headed down the tubes because our oil is running low. But you say, Liam, oil's never been cheaper. So ask me about that. Well, I that you know that's something that's always been kind of confusing to me the uh, economic type of stuff. But I mean, somebody somewhere is controlling the price of oil, right? And they're not doing it based on how much they're paying for it, but doing it in ways that might manipulate the system to their uh, benefit. Am I am I completely wrong here? Well, there's OPEC, you know, the Organization of Petroleum uh, Exporting Countries. They set a price that serves their needs. Saudi Arabia can pull oil out of the ground for a few dollars a barrel uh, because their fields are all legacy fields. The The infrastructure has long been paid for. Well, now they're actually having to build some fracking infrastructure because the old wells are going away. Mm -hmm. When you have to do expensive drilling like fracking, you have to be getting 70 to $90 per barrel. Um, oil is now hovering around 30 when I made the oil alarm video, which you can watch in parts, uh, I haven't released the whole thing yet, but you, uh, it was around 60. It had come down from a high in the 120s or so, uh, even more, just a few, just a handful of years ago when gas got up to about $5 a gallon. So they're charging what the market will bear for oil and what serves them and what covers their cost and what earns them a significant profit. There's a, a rash of bankruptcies in the United States in the oil sector, and Houston is often being called a ghost town because they're putting themselves out of business by competing with the Saudis. And the Saudis came in and said, we're not playing your fracking game. Your so-called oil renaissance only exists if you charge $100 a barrel, and we can charge you, well, 30 That's what the market will bear. Mm -hmm. uh, and you will lose all of the investment capital that you put in which means that banks will be teetering on the brink again because you know some vast pr proportion of the loans that these fracking companies took out will never be paid back. We're looking at an imminent banking collapse um, version 2. We had one. Mm -hmm. 2008. We shall 2008. We shall have another one. We had one in 2008 for the same reason. The United States peaked in uh, the world peaked in total oil availability. In, in, in 2005 or, or so, uh, and the markets responded by um, trying to invest more and getting less. The fracking came along after the 2008, so by 2009 or 10, the fracking thing was unfolding. 2011 or so, 12, um, we had uh, Gasland coming out telling us how poisonous it was, a uh, very excellent film by Josh Fox, and still nobody paid attention. The, you know, the world has now been fracked, and now frac fracking is in an acute hemorrhaging uh, of money and acute bankruptcy all over the United States because we could be temporarily uh, undercut by Saudi, 
by the Saudis and other countries that can pump oil in legacy fields for less. The problem is those legacy fields are also in decline. Fracking is a short-term solution to a very long-term problem. And the problem that we're in is that of, um, of resource depletion. So I did make a video called The Oil Alarm. And if you go to Facebook slash uh, Oil Alarm or go to my webpage, Liam Chef, there's an Oil Alarm page. And it's on YouTube. Okay. And you I'll, can have, watch. I'll make sure all those links are below the video too as well on YouTube and stuff. Excellent. Thank you. So uh, we're looking at a 21st century that is in a, a, a major decline, a, a major decline into multiple collapses. Um, my message was to get people to grow food, but that seems to be about as popular as, you know, I don't know, go vote or something. <laughs> right. So yeah. it's just not doesn't matter. I don't believe in voting anyway, but growing food I do believe in. Uh -huh. Definitely. So that's a warm up. That's where we are. We we live. We're really uh, looking at down the long, bloody, uh, rocky hillside of the collapse. Mm -hmm. uh, the collapse will not be pretty. It's not something that we'll be commenting on excessively on Facebook. We'll actually we'll actively be pursuing food and work in our communities. Uh, commutes will be. Uh, dispensed with if they're too far and require too much gas in the next five, I say, years. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at, an, at, at a rec recoiling culture, recoiling infrastructure. The infrastructure is so damaged in places that a, a vast majority of bridges are ready to fail. A vast majority of highways are ready to be abandoned. Uh, sorry, rural roads, not highways. Um, and uh, the, the oil infrastructure itself is very old. The, elect the electrical infrastructure is the first thing that will go and cause intense panic. Mm -hmm. Well, we can't be bothered with infrastructure when we need to be dropping freedom bombs on the rest of the world, Ian. Well, the freedom, the freedom <laughs> bombs serve their purpose. Uh, distract, distract, distract. Right. Well, look what but, we got going on in uh, Flint. You know? Can't we send a couple dollars their way? Right. Now, their problem is that their water is, as far as I know, toxic. Mm. Yeah, lead, right? Lead poisoning is the big thing. So this was the automotive capital of the United States for a period of time and then wasn't uh, because, it, you know, the, 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 mer the mercenary mercantile system is that we can export a job to the lowest bidder, um, therefore having no real sense of a place or location with work or um, there's no community that can be built around manufacturing because manufacturing only goes to the m person who's most willing to be enslaved to, to do the work. Uh, so that system clearly has no long future and will die. And that system is also driven by the petro, by the availability of cheap oil. Without cheap oil, there's no use in making a new model car every year. So that goes away. Uh, cities will begin to wonder what they were doing instead of building rail lines and train lines, why they let those either go away or why they didn't invest in them. Because they will, they will find that you know, most people have to drive about 20 miles a day and there's just no way to get everybody around. Anyway, it's going to be a huge mess. So are you of the camp that, that this is this financial collapse uh, in terms of something like we had in 2008 is going to be happening this year, 2016? I think that 2016 feels, uh, I think that by the end of the year it will be clear um, that a number of things have fallen off the rails. It's the election year uh -huh. and I don't even know if they'll be able to forestall it as they, as the you know, the planners like to, because this is almost out of their control. Mm -hmm. If there's right now, there's an oil glut because the major producers have been over pumping their fields. Um, it should also be noted that they're pumping, <clears throat> they're pumping them into steep decline. Saudis have been in decline since 2005 or so. They've been pumping seawater into their fields since 1965. The, the, in 2001, the, the, they were getting as much or more seawater out of their oil wells as they were oil. Huh. So, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, these things are well known among people who study peak oil, but nobody studies peak oil because apparently it's not real. No, it's quite real. Um, the, we're going to have a an economic constriction mm -hmm. that's going to make the 1970s uh, look like an era of relative bounty. Because there was plenty of oil in the world 
in the 1970s, it's that the U.S. had peaked in its production and wasn't. Um, what am I allowed to say on your show instead of in terms of cursing? <laughs> I mean, you can curse your ass off. I just got to throw the uh, 18 and older thing on there, whatever. That's right, I'm not going to throw. I don't <laughs> want to throw an 18 year older. I want this to be. Anyway, yeah, um, yeah, no worries. America wasn't um, wasn't filleting the, uh, the people can look that word up uh, <laughs> uh, enough of the countries that were producing at that point to get what they needed. We weren't uh, being being sweet enough girlfriends to them. Uh, we learned our lesson and, and, and learned to be buddy buddy with all the military imperialist, uh, you know, dictatorships that that we could that could produce. And if they wouldn't be our friend, we would demonize them like Venezuela. We would demonize them in the press and try to make them look bad. And that's when you have things that come into play. Like uh, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but he wrote the book uh, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, where he he basically do you know about that? Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, and the name also escapes me, unfortunately, but he's one of those guys who would go make sweetheart deals. Uh-huh. And they learned to leverage countries with loans, uh, infrastructure loans from the World Bank that could never really be paid off. And so you would end up being somebody as well, bitch, uh, in prison parlance. Mm. So you just owed them. You owed, you owed them your cut of rice or oil or diamonds or, or uranium or whatever and in, in an effort not to have to pay back a world bank loan that you really didn't want anyway to build some supermarket parking megalopolis for your poor people to look at in wonder as to why they don't all have just clean water systems. Well, that's too bad. Um, We're in a mess. We're in a huge mess. It's a huge psychotic mess and it's not going to go away anytime soon. In fact, it's not going to get better. The crazy thing about it to me is that if, if to anybody that's paying attention, we are very clearly in a huge mess, but then you've got this huge swath of the population, which I'm afraid to say is the majority that just does not care. They're focused on their playoff football and their what TMZ or whatever it is, right? And then And I'm over here like going crazy trying to tell my family members like, hey, maybe you should look at this or read this or, you know. And they're just like, oh, Trevor, he's reading the internet again. He's had a little bit too much internet or whatever, you know. Yeah, there's a there's a comedian I like called Ty, I think his name's Ty Burr, but I might be wrong. He's a redhead from Boston. Uh-huh. And uh, he's been, he was in uh, the movie The Heat, if you saw that with um, Sandra Bullock. And oh, yeah, Bullock yeah, and, totally, yeah. And the, cat, the, the funny, very large girl whose name just escapes me. Um. I know who you're talking about. Yes, I'm so sorry. <laughs> She's so funny. Okay. Uh, Melissa, Melissa something. So, uh, McCarthy. Yeah. Yes, that's right. There you go. You just remembered her because she was fat. Well, <laughs> that's sort of what she plays at. But she was hysterical. Anyway, there's a red, a Thai bird. He's a comedian. He always gets up and he does his routine. And he says, uh, I've been staying up reading the internet lately. And, uh, you know, they're like... Uh, <laughs> So you can tell that he he has read about 9-11. He's read about all this kind of stuff. He doesn't know how to bring it into his act. Yeah. So he just sort of flirts with it. Um, I don't know what, you know, reading the internet is a funny thing that people say. But, you know, all medical journals, all science journals, all anthropology, anthropology journals and all architectural journals, all government documents, yeah. everything that's written is written on the internet. So uh, well, uh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a very funny thing to say, but obviously patently false because I, like you just, you just all the information that you said that's available on the internet. And then another factor of it, which my, one of my grandparents like, loves to use is uh, I'll find him like a really good YouTube video that explains something, at least in my opinion, really well. And I'm like, there's no way, there's no way she can watch this and it won't at least make her think. And I'll send it over and then I'll get an email back. Oh my God, did you even hear the background music they chose for that, they chose for that video? I swear to God, I've gotten that before. So they, these people will find anything, anything so that their paradigm doesn't get shattered and they can still live in this comfy little world that, that we, most of us think that we live in. Well, Trevor, a paradigm isn't even worth a quarter these days. Uh, so, I, you know, these people can understand that they're able to hide. But what we're, we're talking about is the collapse of a way of life that's built on an obviously non-renewable resource. Uh-huh. It will not be changed by the thinking of New Age people, by the oming of, uh, of people in, at the Maharishi Institute. Uh, no amount of group meditation, no amount of... Um, be the change you want to whatever uh, or of conscious collectiveness will let anybody give you know 
too too much of too too much of a you know two dams about any of it because th- we didn't build this system with thought. We built it with oil. We built it with machines. We didn't build it with intention. We built it haphazardly, one pr- crazy project uh, or maybe a hundred crazy projects at a time because oil is worth that much energy. Oil is worth. Oh God! What is it? Seven years, maybe, of a day job. Seven to ten years of a guy doing a day job. A barrel of oil. A wow. barrel. Forty-two gallons is five point eight million British thermal units. That's twenty-three thousand something. Ten to twenty. At a reasonable estimate, it's ten to fifteen thousand hours of human labor. Wow. It, it, that, that I mean, you're talking years of a of a day job. You're. you're this isn't something that anybody understands because there was no reason to understand it because we were born inside of it. Mm-hmm. We were just born inside of it. And when you're born inside of a culture, you cannot see the culture. It's impossible to see it. All you can do is look at the sides of the bubble that you're in and see your reflection. You know, you mm-hmm. see your reflection in the, uh, in, in, in the iridescent bubble side and you think that it's real and you think that, that it's forever and you think that that's always... And, you know, I, we're inside of this thing that is going to be deflating around us. We're not on the outside looking at it. People mm-hmm. like myself tend to step outside of the bubble. We go through the greasy surface and, you know, the soapy surface and we look and go, Jesus, you guys, you're in a bubble. <laughs> you're in a bubble with your thinking. The stuff that you think is not true. Uh, let me start with the beginning. The gods that you worship are, are not real. The, the stuff that you actually worship is, is plastic and fake money and fake television celebrities. That's what you actually worship because that's where you spend your time. The true God that you worship without realizing it is oil. You worship the petroleum God because the petroleum God gives you everything. The Jesus you worship is truly not an historical Jesus. There's nothing in the thing that you think you talk about when you talk about that that has anything to do even with the Bible, uh, let alone to do with history. Everybody makes up their own Jesus all the time to suit their needs. Uh, the churches that you go to are not real. The Allah that you worship is not anything to do with an historical person. It's just whatever your disposition is in Islam or Christianity, you worship the version of it that suits you. So we're all inside of these bubbles all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I threw in some of the religious stuff cause I, I, I do write about that now. Yeah, no, um, well, that's one of the things that I wanted to, uh, get into for sure. You, you had talked about, uh, myth versus history or myth versus reality. Can we get into that a little bit? Well, it, h- how do you know if something is true? Let me ask you, Trevor, how do you know if something is true? Hmm. Ah, that, well, <laughs> it's a, that simple question that I think begs, a. Uh, difficult answer. Um, how do I know if something is true? I guess maybe if I can feel it and see it or, or I know it to be true being that I, I witnessed it. I mean, I don't know that that is a kind of a tough question. So you see, you can see it with your eyes. Yeah. You can hold it in your hand. Uh huh. Essentially it's real to you. Um, all right. How do you know, how do you know what's, what is, why does anybody care about Star Wars? Is Star Wars real? Here, here's a better question. Is, is Star Wars real? <laughs> no, uh, not at least in the sense that uh, it's, it, it has happened in the past or, or in the future or simultaneously now, at least to my uh, knowledge. All right. So Star Wars isn't a documentary, but Star Wars, the new Star Wars made more money than any movie ever. Huh, yeah. It did. So... Is is it real? You know, it, it's real in a way, but is Star Wars real? Is Han Solo a real person? Now, a lot of guys my age and younger would say yes. No. They'd say yes, we want him to be real. He's a real character. But what does that mean? He's a real character. Um, a myth is a story that is psychologically and emotionally compelling. In fact, an, a myth is a story that's so psychologically and emotionally compelling that we do not give a damn if it's actually true because it is psychologically and emotionally important to us so star wars is psychologically and emotionally important to us um muhammad uh you know allah is an idea muhammad is an idea as descriptions are psychologically and, and emotionally important to many people. Jesus is psychologically and emotionally important to many people. Many people who have never read the Bible 
will claim that they have a personal relationship with Jesus, which is confusing because he's clearly not a real person in their world. It's something they invoke psychologically and emotionally. What's the difference between a myth and reality? A myth doesn't have to be true, but feels emotionally important and psychologically important. It feels psychologically compelling. So, is the the 9-11 official story true? It, it, it's emotionally important to many people that the 9-11 story be considered true. But that's not the same question, is it? I didn't say, is it important that people consider the 9-11 story true? The answer would be yes. Because if they don't consider it true, they'll feel that their idea of America is destroyed. So the idea, the official story of 9-11 is considered true by many people because psychologically it is required for them not to be disturbed. It's, so, uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I mean, I'm, I'm, that's like some kind of uh, internal defense mechanism to avoid having to have that, you know, dark night of the soul, right? Where you have to face these things, where you, right? I mean, is, is that something internally that they're doing subconsciously? Because it, you, I've experienced it myself where I'm putting things in people's faces that it cannot be denied. And they will come up with anything to, uh, like I said, protect protect their paradigm. Right to protect their their paradigm. Uh, but a, is a paradigm true? A paradigm is itself an extended thought or construction about how things might work. It's essentially. A complex, it's essentially an intellectual word for a belief system. But let's ask the question, is Jesus true? I mean, is Jesus true? Now ask any good Christian. Yes, Jesus is true. I talk to him every day. Where do you talk to him? In my head. Oh, well, we have a problem now. I, I'm not, I, and I, again, I'm, I don't want to diminish the, the importance of, of people having a space to have conversations uh, internally. Mm -hmm. Just, but if you call a voice in your head Jesus, um, you've given it a personality and an identity that you really got from somewhere else. I mean, this very important process of having an internal dialogue with the self, the greater self, even the Jungian version of the self, which is actually an extended self, you know, an extended group self. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then you put one name on it that comes from a transliterate, you know, a translation of Greek from you know, Aramaic, from uh, Hebraic, um, from a figure that you haven't even asked yourself if this figure even existed historically, you're just saying you're talking to him. Now, when you say you're talking to a him in your head, you don't really know if it's you who, I mean, it, these are just different parts of human consciousness doing the talking. Yeah, exactly. I, I, and I was just going to say, you, you can probably get into some pretty sticky territory with somebody who is uh, trying to put a, a personality or, a, or, or claim that, or think that this internal dialogue, one of the many voices they might be hearing in their head is actually some God being telling them something. Well, now, now let's, Let's look at the Western problem of the idea of God. In the East, uh, in the Eastern philosophies anyway, the idea is that God is everything. Mm -hmm. I don't mean that God made everything. I mean that God is everything. That the Tao, or the infinite unknowable mind, manifested as all tangible physical creatures what we call creation or material, including sentient beings, including our consciousness, in order to have the experience of, of finitity, of, of being finite. Sorry if I just made up a word. No, no, no. Of fin no. Affinity, of being finite. Uh, because the infinite, this is the, Eastern, this is the Eastern spiritual view, that the infinite um, precipitates or... Um, Ex extends itself or or manifests itself into an area of of being finite in other words of having boundaries top bottom inside outside hot cold male female all that kind of stuff yin and yang so that the yin and the yang are manifestations of an infinite 
source. And the inf you cannot touch infinity. You cannot measure infinity. Infinity has no boundaries. Therefore, it cannot be touched. So we, are, we cannot actually comprehend of it, which is what all religions mean when they say the name you use for God is not the name of God. Even the Hebraic religion touches on that. All religions end up saying that. They all say it, and then they immediately forget it, and they call their God Yahweh or Allah or whatever, and they make a lot of rules that they say came from the God. The God didn't make the rules. Hum human beings made the rules. Um, now, Jesus is a, is a problem because Jesus is a physically manifested son of a virgin who never parted her hymen um, somehow, and then was a god, but not a very good god, because he let the Romans kill him, and he could do all kinds of magic, but he couldn't make fix the holes in his hands, uh, and he could make as much food out of food, but he, you know, why didn't he just bring an airplane down to like take them somewhere? Why didn't he invent a time machine to go to a better time? You know, he's not really an, an infinite god. He's kind of, you know, in in some of the stories, he can't do magic tricks unless people believe in him. What kind of god is that? And then the next writer uh, said that was obviously not a great story, so they changed him to not wanting to do tricks unless people believed in him. The stories in the actual novels, what, what people call the Gospels, I just call them the Jesus novels. <laughs> there are four Jesus novels. Uh, I mean, you know, if you start using their language, you forget that they're just talking about stories written by people. And, and they're just stories written by people. I don't care... All, all, all people agree on that. I mean, all religious people agree. Yes, there's stories written by people. Okay. Well, let's so, let's uh, I, let's for a second for anybody that might not be uh, very educated on this stuff. Can we get into maybe how these three different uh, novels, I guess, right, sort of uh, stemmed from the same uh, thing? I mean, am I right there? Yeah, there are four Jesus novels that got put into the thing called the Bible, and the Bible was really a collection put together in the three hundreds. Uh, by uh, a guy called Eusebius and uh, under an emperor called Constantine. And they were just trying to bring together all the different cults that worshipped a Jewish messiah. And we're and talking were talking about like, the Council of uh, Nicaea, correct? Yeah, there were Nicaea, there was the Nicaean Council, and there were there were many other councils that, that strung along through the early, 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 early Middle Ages um, or the late, late Roman Empire. That really, they had to decide a lot of stuff, like whether Jesus was born a god or whether he was made into a god. That was something they had to decide. There were about, a, there were 70, 100, I don't know, nobody knows how many different novels or gospels, novellas of this Jesus character. Uh, the, the first one was, the first one was written, as far as anybody can tell, by a guy named Marcion. And Marcion was an actual historical figure. He was a shipping magnate who lived near uh, somewhere in Turkey. Um, and the Marcionite Christians had a very they they wrote the first, you know, novel gospel, mm -hmm. uh, or he did, or he and his people did, and he put it out. And it was a collected story. It was it 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 might have eventually served as the genesis for the thing called Luke, uh, because there are some similarities there. And his was a very pagan. Jesus, he was getting, a, he rejected Judaism, he rejected the Jewish God, Yahweh, he said that the God that Jesus was, was a very different God, he said that Jesus never really quite had a body, but Jesus was manifested here, but he could never really be killed, uh, it, you know, it's just superhero stuff, hmm. it's just bizarre superhero stuff, and it comes out of the Judaic belief system that they were going to have uh, a savior who would make sure that they were still Yahweh's chosen people. So you have to go back to ask the question of who were the Jews. Uh, again, the problem in the Western mind about talking about God and this and that and the other thing is people in an Eastern tradition would say that everything is God, that all of the notions that you have are inspired by one deity or another, all deities being a manifestation of the infinite unknowable, Therefore, polytheists are frankly more monotheistic than monotheists who believe that there's a God who has a son and there's a ghost running around and there's a magical virgin and then there are the angels and all this other crap and they still say that only, there's only one God. This is clear polytheism just by a different name. Christianity is as polytheistic as any polytheistic religion. They just don't seem to understand the, the value of it. Polytheistic religions like Hinduism or ancient Greek, under, uh, well, Hinduism especially, and some of the African and Asian religions understand that there's an infinite energy source from which all things 
migrate or trans, um, I don't know, transpire or whatever, precipitate, uh, and that we they they look different at times. So we 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 grant them the difference. All Native American religions understand that there's a great spirit, and then everything else is an incarnation or a manifestation of the spirit in different ways. So those are the they're, those are different gods. Catholics have all kinds of gods. They they create saints and they grant them magical powers after their death. Everybody's polytheistic. I've never met anybody who wasn't. Uh, everybody, you know, everybody who goes to a Disney movie and makes a, a character like, you know, a doorknob in, or or like a little teddy bear into like a living <laughs> creature is a polytheist. That's what polytheism is. You're You're putting a soul into something that you would not otherwise grant a soul. You're seeing the soul in all things. All right. Well, you got to go back to the ancient Hebrew. Oh, oh, oh. so there's no problem in, in a polytheistic culture to say that you're talking to God in your head because there's so many gods you can talk to any of them and they can have different points of view. So you're always fine. Um, in Christianity, you believe you're talking to the one crucified son who is the God, by the way. He's not really the son. He's also the God, which doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Uh, which w who was imbued with the Holy Spirit, which is somehow different but the same, which doesn't make any sense. But you got to go back to the Hebrews, mm -hmm. and the Hebrews lived in in Palestine, uh, right just north of uh, of Egypt, and and they had a real history, and the history involved um, two at least two tribes, the northern the Israeli tribe and the southern the Judean tribe, uh, the, the the tribe of Judah lived in a harder, more mountainous area. The tribe of Israel lived in a, a slightly more fertile era, area and had a little better luck. Um, there was never uh, an imprisonment in Egypt. No archaeologist, no, his, no good historian. There are some biblical historians that will tell you all kinds of things, but there are no actual historians who look at data and material and the cuneiform or, or the hieroglyphic records of, of Egypt, and, and there are scads and volumes and mountains of hieroglyphic records from Egypt. There was no exodus of 600,000 male slaves equaling some quarter uh, of the Egyptian population at, at the time, plus all of their wives, plus all of their children uh, that just left Egypt in the 1400s, 1500s BC uh, and walked through the desert for 40 years and then repopulated Palestine. That didn't happen. There are... No records of it. There are. There's no record of people going missing. There's no record of great crop failures because all the slaves left. Didn't happen. There's no historical Moses. This is an amalgam uh, figure, probably of of a, of a variety. But Moses is influenced in the creation uh, by Sargon, by uh, by the Babylonian and Assyrian figures. And there's a reason for that. The northern Jews were taken essentially. Um, they they kept being overrun by different people. First, the Assyrian Empire coming from the areas that we call Iran and Iraq, then the Babylonian Empire coming from uh, what we now call Iraq, uh, took over the whole area, which borders the Mediterranean. And the intelligentsia, the scribes and the the writers and the um, sorry, the scribes and the priests were all taken into servitude in Babylon. So they were moved to the biggest city of the time. And they got to see a big functioning city that had a law code. The law code was the code of Hammurabi, which was written on a giant, you know, stone uh, tablet. Remind you of anything that had, you know, <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of prescriptions about what you should do, including eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, what a woman should do, what a man should do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, they spent sixty years uh, or so under this rule. They in in they drunk the the myths of Gilgamesh, the myth of Gilgamesh, a man looking for eternal life, who meets um, the man called Utnapishtim, who built an ark because the gods destroyed the earth for being so wicked, and and took all the animals with him, and and then landed, and you know, so so he was an immortal person, you know, favored by the gods for that. He he. They absorbed the lesson of, I think, Sargon being abandoned in a basket as a baby, going down and being discovered by somebody and raised as a prince. Well, does that sound like anything? So all of these myths of Moses, and there was a, there was a Job story, there was a Tower of Babel story, there was a fall from grace um, from the animal nature, the perfect animal nature, uh, in the story of, of, Inky, of Enkidu in, in Gilgamesh, there was a, a perfect garden where people used to live and no longer did. Uh, I think there was even a snake. 
all of these stories are there, and some of them are inverted, like the snake might have been good instead of bad, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The Hebrews inside of Babylon would have wanted to protect their culture, so they would have rejected certain Babylonian ideas while absorbing them at the same time. So if the snake was good, they might have made it bad, uh, but they still would have borrowed all these ideas, and they did, and they wrote, they came back, and, and there in Babylon, they wrote most of what we call uh, the Bible, most of the Pentateuch, most of those five stories. When we think of the Bible, we think of Genesis, uh, Ab Cain and Abel, we think of the flood, and we think of uh, Moses and the exodus from Egypt. Well, you know, there were, there were many people in Palestine who went and inhabited part of Egypt when the, the, the crops would be bad. So there, there were Semitic-speaking people who might have been Hebraic. There were certainly Semitic people from Palestine who overtook a part of Egypt for a period of time and became a ruling dynasty. I think they were the 14th or 15th dynasty of Egypt. Oh, wow. They were called the Hyksos. They may not have been entirely Jewish, but they were Semitic, and they would have. They, the, the, the Egyptians eventually drove them back into Palestine. So there is a record of being expelled from Egypt, but not as slaves, as rulers. Then people were taken as slaves in Babylon, and they wrote a story and they integrated all of this the way that people write myths, the way that J.J. Abrams, you know, uh, and people get together and write Star Wars or Star Trek or Lost or based on stuff that has happened to people, based on mysteries that have already been written about. It, it's just what writers do. They take some remembered experience and they mix it with some mythic elements and they make somebody a Superman. Uh, Hammurabi's code uh, was supposedly given to him by uh, the sun god. Well, Moses' code was supposedly given to him by the sky god. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. There's a reason why... You know, some well, many scholars will tell you that Judaism is a replay of all the other religions that came around it, the same way that the United States its government is a replay of the Roman civilization and the um, the European parliaments. It's it's the same, and then it takes part uh, it takes place in a new environment, so it looks like it's a little bit different. Well, the Hebrews had this story that they were chosen, but they they weren't they were never really loyal enough to Yahweh. They kept worshiping all the other people's gods. Um, they also the I forget to say that the Hebrews had all kinds of gods. Um, one notable god the southern Hebrews had was called Asherah, who's related to you know sort of a a model of Ishtar. Mm -hmm. But they eventually killed her, and and Asherah would have been Yahweh's girlfriend or wife consort. Um, when they killed her, they 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 were left with just one angry male god. Well, now you're really screwed because there's no model for sex anymore. So the Hebrews, more than any group of people on earth, began to condemn female sexuality. Uh -huh. There was no model for female sexuality anymore. There was no temple of the goddess. The Babylonians had Ishtar, but the Hebrews had killed their Ishtar, Ashara, so Ashera. So there was no more uh, there was no more female to sacrifice to or worship or think of in a good way sexually. Well, well, let me ask you this real quick. That's that the culture note. we inherited. Is this? Are we seeing the remnants of that when we see? Uh, in, there's undoubtedly um, terrible treatment of women in the Middle East. Is is, is that sort of? Uh, are we? Is that the remnants of what you're talking about? Well, the Mus the Muslims who had a poly a polytheistic society before Muhammad, who was either real or an amalgam of figure. Um, but but certainly the Muhammad that we think about isn't real. I mean, the problem with talking about historical figures. Who've, who've been made into legends is we're not talking about a real person anymore. We don't know. I mean, there's too much time. So even if people think that there was an historical Jesus, by the way, there's no record of an historical Jesus anywhere written by any historian during his whole lifetime and for a hundred years after. So it comes about as myth. Even if there was... It's not true, Liam. I saw the Shroud of Turin. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Right. I'm sorry. You know, go ahead, do you know how many shrouds, how many death shrouds, how many hundreds of death shrouds there were? How many, <laughs> yeah. how many tons of the true cross uh, ended up being manufactured in Europe, like like a Disneyland, mm -hmm. a Disneyland for Jesophiles? This that, this is what the Middle Ages were about. Um, you know, you could go see the true cross and the true birthplace and the true death place, and you know they they eventually made them into sort of Disneyland events, Disneyland mm -hmm. attractions. They weren't based on an historical location. They were based on, you know, pretty good. This is where maybe it should have been. Uh -huh. um, but, but yes, the Middle, the Middle East went from being polytheistic 
to following the Abrahamic, you know, so-called tradition, another non-historical figure, uh, and deciding that they had to winnow it down to one angry male god who demanded absolute slavish loyalty. In that context, there is no model for female sexuality. And in that context, women are either whores or, or wives. And wives cannot be sexual except to produce children, uh, you know. And whores cannot be wives, and so they cannot be respected. You can have both. But a woman cannot be a wife and be very sexual. And we see this problem over and over again in Western culture. Um, if you're a sexual woman, you're a whore or a slut. Uh, if you're a good wife, you are not very sexual. Now, some Christians will say, no, 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 God encourages it. The problem, the problem with the Bible is that it says so many things. You could decide to only read Song of Songs or Song of Solomon and think it was the grooviest thing on earth. Uh, but then you forgot about Leviticus. And Leviticus is actually the central axis of the Bible. It occurs three times. Uh, the Ten Commandments and then Leviticus and then all the rules that follow in Judges and the rest of that kind of stuff. Uh, and then Jesus comes back uh, in the story to say, you guys failed to uphold the law, so God is having at it one more time, and now I am the law, and all you have to do to, you know, to do the law is to believe in me. Uh, and then in in some of the different novels, you know, some of the novelists, like Mark as a novelist, who wasn't really a guy, but, you know, a group or an idea, the the Mark story is really, um, you know, more fair to the Jews. And then the Matthew story is very pro-Jewish. The Luke story is pretty anti-Jewish, and the John story is absolutely anti-Jewish. So they were trying, by the end, to get away from the Jewish Messiah idea. But the Jesus idea originally for the people who invented it was that they were going to, that Yahweh was going to um, forgive them for not following the law, Leviticus, uh, and sat and do a blood sacrifice, not of an animal, but of a human. Because, uh -huh. you know, they always needed these blood sacrifices. And so there would be one person, when people say, people, Jesus died for my sins, they don't really mean that. We didn't, you know, you don't have to have any sins for Jesus. They mean that the Jews didn't follow the law well enough. And so Jesus was a sacri a permanent sacrifice so people didn't have to follow the law very well. That's exactly what it means. <laughs> Which is a weird thought. <laughs> Which is a really <laughs> bloody weird thought. But that's what Christians mean. Whether they understand it or not, they mean that the Jews failed to follow Leviticus, the 600 and something prescriptions, don't cut your beard, don't cut your hair if you're a woman, don't lie with any woman who's having menses, uh, don't ever lie with a man. Um, if you do this on Tuesday, take an ox and kill it and take a fat and rub it on a brass thing and walk around three times on a left-hand circle. And if you don't do that, we'll kill you. So that's Leviticus, and if you, it's the most obsessive, compulsive document that anybody could ever write or read. Can, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but there's, I mean, let's like get into a few more of the uh, funny aspects of that. There's, it, it also says no tattoos, correct? I mean, there's just a ton of ridiculous things. Uh, don't tattoo yourself, standards. don't mark your skin. Uh, there, there are a lot of things you can't do. Uh, cutting your beard is is one of them, of course, or or squaring it and cutting your hair. If you're a woman, you can never cut your hair ever. Mm -hmm. So uh. you know the fundamentalists in America grab Leviticus and they form these cults, these sort of Amish-looking cults, and the women are not allowed to cut their hair. And our our friend Joni uh, Abbott actually was in one of these, and she escaped, mm -hmm. and she'll tell you all about it. They they actually quote Leviticus, and and you know what? I want to grant the fundamentalists something. They're right. That's what the Bible's about, which is. You know, the Bible is about Leviticus. Jesus said in one of the pro-Jewish scriptures, I think it was Matthew, if you think I'm, I'm here to throw away the law, you're wrong. I'm here to uphold the law, you MRFers. <laughs> so so what, he, what, what the, guy who, the guys who wrote Matthew were saying was, no, 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 we're sticking up for the old Jewish law, so you still have to do everything. Ah, you can't get divorced just because you want to. Uh, let, you know, you cannot get divorced no matter what. That's a covenant with your God, Yahweh. So you can't get divorced. I don't care if your husband's kicking you when you're pregnant. Who cares? You can't get divorced. Uh, so all of the things, you know, slavery is fine as long as they're not in your tribe. Jesus was not Jesus the guy, but the people who wrote him was, you know, were very clear about that. They didn't want to get rid of the things that worked for them. Yeah. Now, the final Jesus story that got included is so different. Instead of the thing taking a year, it takes three years. Um, he's always magical. He's the Alpha and Omega. He's not different at all from Yahweh. And he's transcendent. When he dies, he doesn't say, 
father for he doesn't say what what the hell have you done to, you know where have you where have you been uh, what have you done for me lately or where have you been <laughs> and uh and he doesn't say god forgive them he just says it is done like i'm ready to go now i'm in control he surrenders himself I, you know he doesn't he's just there to fulfill a he's not it's so unrealistic he's there to fulfill a prophecy so that the new christian movement that had already emerged by the time this thing was written in the probably 120 or so this reformulation of the story changing all of the details except that he was the son of yahweh but not really anymore he is yahweh as the son of yahweh strange he is the Holy Ghost as the Son of Yahweh. And then when he dies, he doesn't say, um, my God, my God, why have, thou for, why have you forsaken me? He says, uh, uh, ready to go, click, and then he dies. He doesn't die until, <laughs> click, he wants to die. David Fitzgerald points this out in his book, and I'm paraphrasing him. His book is called Nailed, um, and you can get it on Amazon. And um, I'll include some of this in mine, but... But the stories are so, they're, they're clearly written by different political factions. All you have to do is read them and go, wow, that's really freaking different. Hey, hey, that's really different. Well, the first guy was Mark, but they didn't like the story because he wasn't very magical. It was just, you know, not very interesting. The second one was Matthew, and that was really punched up, and the, the, uh, the, the, the power of the miracles or the magic tricks was increased, and they didn't take as long to accomplish, and they weren't as weird. Like, you know, he didn't just kill a fig tree because the fig tree wouldn't produce fruit. And then Mark is like, ah, screw you, fig tree. <laughs> you are dead to me. <laughs> well, let me uh, ask you this. I, I, I definitely want to touch on a, at least a couple more things before we get, I, we got to get off here. But to sort of wrap up the idea of uh, myth or religion, I guess religion specifically, and maybe even specifically the Council of Nicaea, which we spoke to a little bit earlier. Uh, to what degree do you think this, this thing as a whole um, – these different religious practices, how much do you think that was all geared and the changes that were made to it were geared towards control? Well, there's a movie called Caesar's uh, Messiah, I think. And there, there's always an idea that when things happen, somebody was in charge and they knew what they were doing. Yeah. It's very often not that way. And and I look at it from a more sy systems approach. I look at us as a species and as a species, I can tell you that we like to have somebody in charge of our political realm, and we like to have somebody in charge of our so-called spiritual or religious realm. Um, we're willing to let them be the same person. So the Egyptians had God kings, and the first kings were always God kings, and they were God on earth, and they were kings. Now, were they really God on earth? No, people said they were, so they did what they said. Um, we eventually split up God and King, and, and, and of course the popes and the kings would always fight, which is amusing, <laughs> uh, because they were both in charge of some aspect of people. And people willingly surrendered their mental uh, faculties to these two groups of individuals, the aristocrats, uh, the oligarchs, and the priestly class. Uh, and it is a terrible thing to note about human beings that we are... like ants, like bees, mm -hmm. but we are. Uh, and there are very few of us, precious few of us, who are by our strange, curious nature willing to stand on the outside and say, uh, hey, uh, guys, yeah, you're in a bubble. And I don't feel like being a bee worshiping that God because it's a God that's in your mind. Now, back to the you create your own reality. There didn't. There never had to be a Yahweh for people to believe in a Yahweh. All there had to be were hard winds and uh, a lack of rain and you know some you know a sky god, an idea of a sky or mountain god. All there had to be was a mountain for there to be a mountain god. All there has to be is there a river for there to be river goddess. It's nice that we do that. It's nice. That's why I'm much more of a polytheist because at least if you're a polytheist, you give everything its its eternal nature. Mm -hmm. You know, well, there's a river goddess and a sky god and a moon goddess and a sun god and all the rest. And you don't let one have the whole field. The Christians of the Jews took it so bloody literally. Well, well, we'll get rid of all the others and we'll just say there's one. Well, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, because, you know, if you have one and then he's a person, then he's walking the earth, bestriding the earth, you've confused your metaphor. It's a very confusing metaphor and it doesn't work. 
it really boggles the imagination and it just doesn't work. Um, and then you end up being loyal to the idea of God. The problem with the Old Testament or the, the Torah or the, you know, the various books that f form the Old Testament is there are so many different versions because you know, the gods were taken from so many places. And there's El, who was a god in the south, and there's Elohim, who are the gods, plural. Asherah is referred to obliquely. Her name is changed to the grove in some versions and is left Asherah in others. Um, there, there are even more and more. There's a moon god and a sun god, and there are planetary gods, and there are other gods referred to. There, there are the real Babylonian gods who are referred to, Baal, and all the versions of Baal, B-A-A-L. So God is all over the place as all these different things. The Hebrews and Christians imagine that they have to settle on one thing and then find some moral center to it. This is a problem of human thinking. We're much saner as polytheists than we are as monotheists because we understand that things exist in multiplicity and in, uh, in a kind of, um, uh, what do I want to say, in a kind of almost secular there's almost more of a democracy if you allow everything to be infused with spirit. Mm. That you know, you have a more democratic view if you say the river goddess is angry with the humans f for um, you know damming the river. You say, oh, okay, that's cool. I get that. We'll we'll honor the river goddess and undam the river and let the life flow again. But if you say God wants us to own the land and God gives us dominion over the animals, you don't care about the river goddess anymore. Mm. Fuck. Screw, sorry, I just ruined your... No, 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 no. I think we both cussed a few times. I just said it's, it's all good. No, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. Screw the river <laughs> goddess. Screw, screw the river goddess, you know? Screw her. Not in a good way either. Yeah. It's great to have sex with the river goddess. Beautiful. <laughs> but screw the river goddess. Uh, we're going to build the dam because Yahweh gives us manifest destiny. And Ma Yahweh is an imperial war god. That's what Yahweh was. So we've ended up worshiping a war god forever. Is it about control of people? It's a mistake that was made... Because the people in charge, like Constantine, saw that the entire army was worshipping uh, Mithras and uh, uh, Ad, uh, uh, what is it, uh, Ada of uh, Addis of Phrygia, and and Jesus was really the sequel to Mithras and uh, Addis of Phrygia. He was really born in the same soul, you know, the same winter period, and he was born to a virgin, and he was. It's all the same story. Uh, and then they dress it up and they infuse it with a lot of stuff that was said in the Old Testament. So most of most of the like the important stuff that Jesus supposedly says is just the writers looking at the Old Testament and shoving words from the Old Testament into his mouth. The same way they do in the new Star Wars movie where they have Han Solo talk about the Kessel Run in less than 12 parsecs. Well, they're just quoting the first movie. It was a dumb thing to say then. It's a dumb thing to say now because a parsec isn't a measure of time. Um, you know... I got to go in a few parsecs here. Yeah, but, it's, <laughs> but but they have to include it because you feel like there's a consistency with storytelling. Uh -huh. Storytelling is what's at root here, and you know Yeshua, Yehoshua, Yeshua, Yeshu, whatever you want to call him, was written to fulfill the needs of storytelling much more than he was, you know, a real person. And you can tell by understanding the differences in the four Jesus novels. And by the way, the 70 Jesus novels that didn't make the cut, if you want to go look at the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, you got 70 things that the, uh, the, the clowns in Nicaea decided not to allow in. Then you, you start to get a much wider version of the Jesus story, which is what, you know, people who think that he's an historical figure say, oh, he was real, but they kept it out. He wasn't real. These are stories. He's, you know, it doesn't. It, there are just too many stories that are too contradictory to worry about whether it's real or not. It was clearly a political idea that was being owned by various factions, uh, and this has been well covered by different authors. So, is it about control? People are willing to be brainwashed. They want it. They like it, and you are at your own peril if you try to shake them awake. If you've ever seen the movie Step Brothers, you know, never wake up a sleepwalker. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about it. <clears throat> I've got a, I mean, you and I have kind of talked about it privately, but with, you know, the things with family members and stuff that, uh, you're right. It, it is sort of like waking somebody that's sleepwalking and they are not into it. <laughs> uh, no, why? The, the, you know, the, uh, you know, Frank Herbert, Frank Herbert, I guess, who wrote Dune, had the line that the sleeper must awaken. Um, and it's if you if you read that book, I read it when I was a, a young teenager, and so some of it stayed with me. Yeah, but yeah. 
the sleeper must must awaken is is interesting. But the idea people ask people are always talking about the turning point and the uh, what do you call that critical the, mass? Uh, yeah, critical mass. And I always say, <laughs> dude, come on, uh, what are you talking about? The you know, hundredth monkey effect. <laughs> yeah. Well, the problem is there's seven there's seven billion monkeys, yeah. and a hundred monkeys are an ant. Uh, you know, on the side of the Empire State Building. It just doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. What matters is the amount of energy that we have as a society to keep this charade going. That is where uh, our God lives. Our God is oil, and our God keeps the fields covered with glyphosate and with anhydrous uh, ammonia to make things grow without any nutrition. Our God uh, are the giant combines that plant and pick it. Our God are the giant factories that process it and, and, the, and the trucks, the millions and millions and millions of trucks that ship our food to us at all times. Our gods are the giant pumps that pump water out of the declining Central Valley and Ogallala aquifers. We're in huge trouble mm -hmm. and uh, our gods will not save us. <laughs> Yeah, that was amazing. I, I think I did want to touch real quick if you still had a few minutes, and I know it's a big subject. We could obviously do an entire show just on this, but let's get into uh, what's going on in California for a minute. I know that you, that, uh, you much like me, are, are trying to get family members to move out. I'm in my last few weeks here, but there's some big things going on. We have Fukushima. There's this methane gas leak. Uh, can we spend a few minutes just talking about that? Yeah, I, 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 I agree that last bit was a little bit poetical, so uh, the, the gods will not save us is a line that I'll probably reuse. But, no, I did like that. But, um, well, it reminds me, uh, that one of the best shows, you know, television is, um, is a kind of disaster land for broken, half-baked ideas. <laughs> but sometimes people have used it for art. And The Sopranos reached the level of art, Mad Men reached the level of art, and a show called The Wire reached the level of truth. Um, a show called The Wire, which is about Baltimore, uh, right near Washington, D.C., city where I spent a little bit of time growing up. And, um, and it, it's a city in, in which if you are brown-skinned and of a certain economic class, your best bet is to get into the drug business. And if you're brown-skinned or light-skinned and have a certain mindset, your best bet is to get into the cops the cop business to bust all the people in the drug business. And then there's everybody else who just goes about and pretends as this doesn't exist. Um, but it's, it's this, you know, light and dark side of the same coin. And it's a fantastic program. If you have not seen the wire, I recommend all five seasons of it. It will, it might change your perspective. Of, it's so enlightening about human beings, but there's a line in, in which uh, the, one of the chiefs of police is talking to the cops about improving their numbers and improving their drug busts and cleaning up the street corners. And he says, this is Baltimore, gentlemen. The gods are not here. The gods will not hear you. <laughs> uh, and it just reminded me of that, even though I didn't intentionally say that. So our gods, our Jesus, and our Yahweh will not save us from oil decline, nor will they save Southern California uh, from its steep decline. Now, I think, it's, I think we've seen the beginning of a steep decline. Uh, California has been on a slow boil evaporating most of the water that it was sucking out of the Colorado River, Northern California, Oregon, um, uh, the, the Owens Valley, um, and the electricity that it siphons from the dammed Colorado, dammed Colorado uh, behind the Hoover Dam in the, the declining Lake Mead. These western cities are going to begin to sizzle like water drops on a frying pan. Um, 18 million people live in the greater Los Angeles area or thereabouts, uh, 18 million. This is an unbelievable amount of people. In 1800, there were about 4 million people in the United States <laughs> as a whole. Wow. So what we have here is nothing but a disaster land about to be manifest in the bloodiest hues of, of scarlet that anybody's ever heard of or seen. Um, there is no food growing anywhere. This is a, a, a mini nation of highways, greasy, knotted roads, um, and it's totally dependent on water to feed it and food trucks to bring it food, water from very far away. Um, now it's energy in the form of gas to heat homes and to cook things is spewing into the air 
because the Southern California uh, gas uh, industry stored its gas in in an area that they had once pumped it from. So they actually pumped a lot more in there as a, as a storage vessel. So somebody must have said, well, it once held oil or gas. Let's fill it again with gas, which is lighter than air. What's the worst that could happen in an earthquake zone? Yeah. And that, um, like a lot of other things, I, I don't think even in L.A. is getting at nearly as much, or in California really, nearly as much coverage as, coverage as it should be, much like Fukushima, which I is a huge thing. I mean, I'm, I'm afraid to go in the water or eat anything out of the Pacific, to be honest with you. Well, um, Los Angeles will deal with this increasing methane geyser. They've tried to fix it seven times and they've made it worse. Uh, it's now a it's now a, something like a 25 foot or, or more wide mouth, you know, caldera, I think they're, they're calling it, that's spewing methane into the sky. Now, the people who got behind Al Gore's um, <laughs> movie about be the change in the world by buying a Prius is, is you know, dramatic slideshow uh, about how we're responsible for carbon dioxide. You know, in Al Gore's... on his Learjet and shit. In his Learjet. Uh, but, but in Al Gore's ridiculous movie, not once that I recall did he say, you know, we could all stop eating meat. Uh, actually, we should stop raising cattle because they're methane producers. And methane is uh, a more concentrated greenhouse gas by an exponential factor than carbon dioxide. Oh, no, never mind. Never mind. Never mind we're going to actually have to give up cars and get on street trolleys. Never mind that um, international jet travel is more or less going to have to go the way of the dodo. If, we're, if, if what he's saying is true, there's only one way around it, which is to stop Western agricultural, uh, animal agriculture, and secondly, to deeply in impact the way that we make electricity through coal, and nuclear and and other things. Well, no, he didn't say that. He said, write your congressman and buy a Prius. That's what it said at the end of the movie. So that's the takeaway. Buy a Prius and write your congressman. So that movie is ridiculous and has no value because uh -huh. um, it's a lie. Uh, even if everything in it was true and that was the answer, it would still be a lie because the answer would be all of its, you know, if you exclude the fact that animal agriculture is is causing more of carbon dioxide, more CO2, more methane than anything else except the oil industry, which I don't think he touched either. I, I can't tell you what that movie was about except it was a movie like, um, it was a, movie like a Bernie Sanders campaign. Uh, my, my friend Benny Wills of the Joy Camp was complaining uh, very rightfully to me the other day about people in his generation who were saying, man, healthcare should be free. Man, education should be free. And he's saying, what do you exactly mean by free? I mean, do you think that nobody is going to pay for this? Do you think that no, you know, you're going to get better, and nobody's just people are going to wave their hands? You're better. You're, you're you're asking for something, and there's going to be a cost for it somewhere. You mean that you're going to increase taxes to increase the pharmaceutical state, but nothing is entirely free. So we've got California, which is sort of brain dead liberal on one hand, and then um, rancher and or, you know um, rural sort of um, <laughs> oaky conservative. I don't on the think other. I've heard a more uh true evaluation of California, California's population. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's a total disaster. Nobody can think. Nobody. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm in Santa Barbara. I'm in, like, the uh, peak of, like, the yuppie, new agey, like, but the weird end of it where they're all, like, sort of, at, you know, have their, looking down their nose at you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, they create their own reality, you know. <laughs> They made Santa Barbara with their minds. Yeah, there's a lot of the uh, like yoga moms driving around in their you know, Priuses, maybe, with their Ohm sticker or whatever on the back. <laughs> yep, yeah, Be because they live in a bubble. And the bubble says, I don't care where the Prius came from. I don't care how many Chinese people or children died because of the heavy metal toxic lakes that are made necessary to make these large electric batteries. It doesn't matter because I'm in my bubble. That's okay, as long as I'm in my bubble. That's uh -huh. the problem. It's not the problem with California. It's not the problem with uh, religious people. It's the problem with people. We're not built to be global. We're built to be local and tribal. So we will fail. Um, there's really nowhere for us to go but smaller. Once we're smaller, if we survive the radioactive holocaust that is hundreds and thousands of years long coming from Fukushima, maybe tens of thousands of years long, 
maybe longer than human beings have ever actually lived on the planet, maybe 200,000 years long, will be the onslaught from Fukushima and all of the other nuclear reactors that fail in the next 50 years, which they will, many will do. It's not the last one that's going to fail. Um, if we actually survive that in pockets around the world, we'll be driven back to tribal identities. And all of this talk of modern and science and technology will go away. And people will be either subsistence farmers, herders, or foragers. They will worship the sun god and the moon goddess. They will worship the river goddess and the mountain god. And they will make sacrifices on occasion to the god because it satisfies their anxiety to be, um, to be small before which the, what they can't control. If we never made a sacrifice to the sun god or the moon god, the sun would be going on fine and the moon would go around the earth fine. But because we're anxious, we make these sacrifices. It doesn't bother me. I pray before I eat. I'm not Christian, but I pray before I eat. I just slow down and connect with the spirit of the universe and make sure that I'm taking my food in correctly with a feeling of, uh, of centeredness and appreciation for the healing qualities. And, you know, that's what I do. But I, you know... I don't want to pray for a bicycle, uh, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Dear God, give me a bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> please, if I could just have this Ferrari. <laughs> oh, Lord, please grant me a Mercedes Benz. <laughs> well, Liam, I could easily talk to you about all of this stuff for two, three more hours, but I did trim my mustache this morning, so I've got to go sacrifice my ox here. But is there, any, <laughs> is there anything that you'd kind of want to say to wrap it up i'm gonna have all the links to your book which we neglected to talk about today official stories or your new one but hopefully i will have you on again soon um i'll have all the links your facebook and all that kind of stuff wherever anybody is listening to this youtube itunes uh podomatic whatever you're using um right. but is there is there anything that you'd like to say just to kind of wrap things up so would um uh, we we live in in a network of people if what i said was moving to you if it interested you if it was outside of your usual bubble or paradigm and you want to support this kind of thinking you can donate to my cause at the level of five or ten or twenty dollars yes i'm uh, i'm a capitalist like the rest of you <laughs> by going to my facebook or youtube which is liam chef or my website which is liamchef.com and there's a paypal link you can donate five twenty fifteen whatever dollars that you would like a hundred um if you want to buy books in bulk, that's five or more books, you can write me on Facebook and I will get those books to you at a discount. Um, I think it's nine or ten. If you buy over a certain amount, it's nine or ten dollars. If you buy over a certain amount, it's eight, eight or so dollars. And I include shipping as long as the shipping is not exorbitant for me. Uh, and I, I, you know, I pay for the shipping as opposed to Amazon, which is uh, now 12 or 13, uh, 12 bucks plus shipping. Um, so you can do that. You can support my independent work by buying the Kindle version, which I think is four dollars, uh, three you or four dollars, cannot beat that. Cannot beat that. That's it official 10, stories. Official stories. Ten topics. Eleven chapters. CIA, JFK, vaccination, nine eleven, HIV, Big Bang, plate tectonics, and more. All the lies that we were taught in school that are more or less religious fictions. Um, and again, I'm not an atheist, so Christians can read me as long as they understand that the greatest thing in the world is the mystery of the world, rather than the literalism of any religion. Awesome. I cannot recommend uh, your stuff to everybody out there enough, especially um, with official stories being $4 on Kindle or you're, you're able to buy multiple copies, like you said, at a discounted rate. That is a book that I give to people to try and wake them up. So I, I cannot recommend that enough for people out there listening. Definitely check it out. And uh, I cannot thank you enough, Liam. This has been an excellent conversation. Thank you, my friend. We will talk soon. Definitely. We'll have you on soon. Ladies and gentlemen, you may now unbuckle your safety belts and move about the cabin freely. That is that, and I hope you all enjoyed it. Liam was on fire, like I said, right? He's an incredible dude, brilliant. Um, I highly urge, if, if you're monetarily capable, to uh, go and support that guy. He's putting out incredible stuff every day. If nothing else, go pick up that $4 Kindle version of Official Stories. That book will blow your socks off. It'll definitely blow the socks off of any of your friends or family who like to cling to those official stories. So, yeah, definitely get out there, support Liam, check him out on social media. He's really active on Facebook. And, like I said, he's putting out good stuff every day. Also, keep your eyes out for his book. 
his new book, I should say. Also, if you haven't yet uh, checked out the website, vibeandhire.com, you can check out the entire podcast archive. There's a bunch of articles by myself and other contributors. We've got a couple more contributors coming on board, so lots of cool things happening at the website. I hope that you guys will keep your eyes peeled and check it out. And for those of you that have gotten in touch with me about um, like the music that we use on the podcast, I, I do want to point you all in the direction of my buddy. He's the one who made the intro to the podcast. It's NevadaMSmith.com. I know a lot of you are out there. There's there's lots of people this year that are trying to get active and, and doing their new podcast and making a blog and doing whatever they think that they should be doing or that they want to do to help affect some positive change in the world. And as some of you may know, if you're putting content onto YouTube that's not 100% original, and in some cases even the original content, is getting flagged, taken down, YouTube channels shut down, all that kind of stuff. So if you want to avoid that, um, and some of you have asked, the guy that I use, my longtime friend, Nevada Smith, it's uh, nevadamsmith.com. I wish all the luck in the world to those of you that have contacted me about this kind of stuff, and those of you that are, are doing it on your own and I haven't heard from. This is going to be a big year. A lot of people are getting involved, and it truly is exciting for me. So I hope that you all enjoyed this podcast. Definitely keep your eyes peeled and your ears open. We've got some really cool things coming up, but I don't want to spoil it. I hope you all have an incredible February coming up, and we'll be seeing you here next time at the Vibe and Hire podcast.